Uh, hopefully I can tell you, impart some of my knowledge about the DeSouter uh, to you just now. I flew it for the very first time and landed one hour ago. Uh, so we flew it for the first time this morning. I, I figured it'd be quite interesting to talk about my experiences this morning, what, what we do when we approach a new aircraft at the collection, uh, and some of the qualities and the, the handling qualities, what it's actually like to fly this aeroplane. I'm not a terrific historian, so if you want to know the history of the DeSouter company, there are some excellent books in the shop. The collection guidebook will tell you all about it. Um, joking aside, it's a 1931 aeroplane, so it's nearly 80 years old. It was built by the DeSouter Air Aircraft Company uh, of Croydon, uh, and Richard Shuttleworth bought it originally to pick up parts for his sports cars from the Bentley factory. It was one of his uh, original aeroplanes. So it's been here for an awfully long time. He, he raced the aeroplane in uh, the King's Cup air races, 1934, 33-34. Uh, um, he, he, he made some pretty significant alterations, uh, redesigned the, the tail section, put in a much larger uh, engine. And the aircraft was kept here, it went on loan to a couple of museums around the UK. And then around 1985 time, it was brought back here uh, for, a, for an extensive rebuild and made back into an original uh, Mark I De Souter with the original engine and the original tailplane. It flew again for the first time in 1998. Turns out there's some, some quite clever things about the design of this aeroplane. If you think in the, the 30s, this was quite a radical design really, uh, uh, an enclosed cockpit monoplane. It's quite unusual, it was built really as an air taxi, so the pilot sort of uh, a single seat for the pilot in the front. You, you have to fold the back of the seat down to climb in and it's at an angle, so it's a bit of a you have to use some ropes to climb in and, and then fold the seat back up behind you. So it's a bit of a, uh, a work of acrobatics to get into the aircraft, but great fun. And then there's two seats in the back um, for, your, for your passengers. The, the joke in the collection is it's built a little bit like a large uh, wardrobe. Uh, so it's quite boxy, um, but it's, it's, it's really nice inside. The, um, the, the field of view afforded to the pilot is, is really quite restricted. Especially when you're in a turn, you have an excellent view of where you've been, but not necessarily where you're going or want to go next. So uh, turning corners uh, needs a bit of planning, needs a bit of planning. But it's excellent in a straight line. It gives, you, it gives the passengers, especially in the back, big windows. They've got a, a little skylight through the roof, through, through the wing section as well. The passengers get a really nice view of the countryside. So you can see it would have been quite an appealing aeroplane to fly in as a, as a passenger. Um, some, some clever tricks, it's got wash in on the wing, so the, the outboard section is increased angle of attack than the inboard when you fly. But actually the stalling and handling characteristics in the stall are, are really quite nice. It's, it's not nearly as, uh, as, as challenging as you might think. The, the aircraft has a, a Hermes engine, Cirrus Hermes engine, very similar to that fitted in the, the 60X Moth here. We've got Richard Shuttleworth's uh, Cirrus Moth. Um, the, uh, undercarriage is very unusual, it sits on these big long stilts and there's a really long travel, that's the kind of oleo just here, when you get airborne the, the wheels kind of sink down almost under the aircraft so when you come to land again uh, you sort of set the, the attitude that you're in at takeoff and the wheels touch down quite a lot sooner than you'd expect because they're sort of hanging down in the, in the breeze uh, without the aircraft weight on top of them. So it's an unusual undercarriage, very unusual indeed. Structurally, it's an unusual aeroplane too. The wing is not structurally collected to the fuselage. All of the load from the wings goes through the, through the struts and braces here, and the, the, the fuselage is almost suspended under the wing. When uh, Dodge Bailey, the chief pilot, took this aircraft flying for the first, uh, first few times, they encountered some quite significant aileron flutter where the um, airflow and instability airflow starts to excite um, oscillations in the ailerons. Uh, it, can, it often is very destructive when that happens, but um, got away with it. It's got these lovely mass balances now you can see on the, on, on the wingtips to, to alleviate that problem. Uh, the original design called for aileron control rods that are obviously very stiff. Uh, when DeSouter bought the design from the, 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 um, the, the original designer, they replaced the rods with cables, which obviously can go slack and, and in, increase the likelihood of having slightly odd um, aeroelastic effects in the wing. So I said I'd talk a little bit about how we approach flying new aircraft today um, 
and, and what I went through this morning to take this flying for the first time. So um, it all starts with preparation and really through the, the pilot's notes and the checklist and starting to understand the, a little bit about the aircraft systems, um, how it differs significantly from other aircraft of the period. So it's got a right hand propeller, uh, the engine and the prop go right hand. So uh, as compared to things that I fly very regularly like the Chipmunk, the Tiger Moth, which they, uh, they go the other way. So you, you, you have to, your feet have to work in the opposite sense, the rudder to keep the aircraft going straight. So little things like that um, become quite important. So reading through the notes, have a sit in the aircraft, um, work out how to get in and out, which is in some of these older aeroplanes is, is not necessarily all that simple. Uh, fam Familiarise yourself with the controls. Again, with early aircraft, uh, they, they tend not to have very many. So th this aircraft has a, a fuel tap, uh, an elevator trim, uh, stick, uh, a, a few select instruments and really that's about it there's no flaps there's no brakes um, that, that's that, that's all you got so once you've found those things you, you're pretty much good to go uh, I then sat down over coffee with one of the other more experienced pilots that's flown this quite a few times with uh, Mark Sharp and he's sort of taught me through um, his experiences some of the handling qualities uh, of the aircraft the unusual differences uh, and we talked through what we're, going to go, what we're going to go and do, and then I took the aircraft off on my own. Um, so starting up the engine um, with, with ground crew in attendance, they prime the aircraft externally uh, so, to uh, get, get, get the, uh, the cylinders primed. Then it's a quick chat between pilot and ground crew, fuel on, throttle set, contact, prop swung and she started first time. So that's, that's uh, always a nice thing. Quick warm up of the engine for a few minutes and kind of get used to the, the general ambiance of the aircraft with the engine running. Um, get the ground crewman to uh, hold on to the tail where we do a quick run up check to not quite full power, about 50% or, or maybe three quarters power, about 1600 RPM. Check the magneto drop on each side, check both sides of the ignition are, are working on the aircraft uh, and, then, and then we're ready to go so taxi out to the runway um, again keeping the ground crew guy because um, this aircraft has no brakes and the tail skid is not connected to the rudder at all and it's sort of semi castering so it's a bit of a shopping trolley like again like a lot of these early aircraft so um, generally here at Old Warden with the aircraft that don't have brakes will have a wing walker to help move the aircraft around on the ground. It's just not worth, it's easy to do, it's a bit labour intensive, but it's, 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 it's worth it. So we keep, keep someone with us right until we're lined up on the runway, wave off the ground crew, and then uh, once we clear takeoff, just smoothly opening the throttle, getting a feel for keeping the aircraft straight. Uh, and then once you're at full throttle, you sort of you can't quite see over the nose. If you look out to the side, you can see either side, more or less straight air, but not quite then unweight the tail, get the aircraft into a sort of level attitude, and then things become quite a lot easier. The, 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 the undercarriage is quite springy, so bounce along the runway, and then at about 50 miles an hour, um, just easing back on the stick, and she flies away really nicely. The engine's quite a low revving engine, so soon after takeoff, um, uh, easing back on the power just a little bit, once we're climbing away, check of the oil pressure, and off we go. And you get a lovely view of the of the countryside, it feels a bit like looking through a letterbox uh, when you, the pilot's head is sort of, sort of here, so you've got this little letterbox to look through. Um, and as I said before, as soon as you turn, the, the top wing blanks where you, where you want to look. So before you start a turn, it's, you have to sort of lift a wing, make sure there's nothing in the way, and then, and then turn and get pointing the way you want to go. Um, I took her up to about 2,000 feet over towards Cardington, uh, had a look at longitudinal handling, so handling and pitch. Um, the trim's very powerful, uh, there's, there's plenty of trim authority, probably a bit too much if anything, um, but she, she handles nicely in pitch, she's very heavy in roll, a uh, big thick wing, big fat, fat cord on the wing as well, so lots of damping roll, and the control forces in roll, really quite heavy, not very well matched to the pitch controls at all. If you think, it's designed to fly A to B in a straight line, so that's probably not outrageous, you know, it's not a fighter, it's not an agile fighter, it's uh, uh, a gentlemanly air, air carriage. So that's probably not unreasonable. Um, I had, had a look at the stall. Stall's very benign, so just let the aircraft slow down, sort of simulated flying and approach, but at height. 
um, slowed down to about 55 knots, uh, sorry, 55 miles an hour, which is the approach speed for the aircraft, um, and then just put it to idle, simulate just holding off in the flare, ready to land, and about, there's, there's very little buffet from the aircraft, it doesn't really give you much warning that it's about to stall, other than the controls go a bit, a bit sloppy, it gets noticeably quiet, and then she just rolls off very gently, very benign stall. Slightly loaded, so pretend you're flying around the, fin the finals turn with a bit more lift from the wing. Um, in a left hand turn, she rolls off to the right in the stall, and in a right hand turn, she rolls off to the left. And you can't ask for anything more than that. So it'll naturally roll you away from, from the ground and keep you out of trouble. So it's, it's really quite remarkable for, for something you think it's got washing in the wings, it's got high wing, uh, big square fuselage. Actually, behavior at low speed is really, really good. So that, that all makes this really quite a good aeroplane for taking uh, Lord and Lady, whoever they might be, uh, to go and land in a meadow outside their stately home. It'd be quite good for that. Um, so the heading side slips, I looked at putting on rudder and putting her into a side slip. And again, it's she's very benign. So that's important for uh, controlling the aircraft in a crosswind. If you're trying to land in a crosswind, look at how easy it is to apply rudder and get side slip going. Really, really quite nice, not much to, not much to say. Back here for a, first of all, for a, a practice force landing. Uh, so power off about 60 miles an hour in the glide. She glides for a long way. She glides for a long way. Um, she, th this aircraft's notorious among the collection pilots for landing long. So it, she, she's, she glides very well and it will float a long way if you're not absolutely on your threshold speed as you come over the, over the hedge here. So uh, quick, quick go to a force landing, a uh, couple more circuits for practice. Um, again, being been caught out a little bit by the, the undercarriage that dangles down. So you, you touch the ground, the, the wheels start to spin up without any real weight on them. And you hear them touch down and start to rumble before you, ex before you think you're going to, because they, 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 they're hanging down that little bit further. Then into a quick practice display, five minutes of wing overs. Uh, and then, um, Another circuit to land, uh, land back on. It's sort of left with. So it's nearly an 80-year-old aeroplane. There's, I think there's two DeSutas, a Mark One and a Mark Two, uh, remaining that are in airworthy condition. Um, there's another one, another one or two in museums around the world. There's only about 40, 40 or 50 of these made in total. You sort of, sort of sit down and and reflect on, on the experience of being allowed to fly something like this for the first time. It's a tremendous privilege. There's lots a, a modern pilot would say is wrong with this aeroplane. It's 80 years old, you know, it was early days, the early days of aviation still, uh, and making light aircraft that, that uh, are adaptable and flexible. And to, there's lots to like about it, I, I think, and it's, it's a fascinating aeroplane. Um, to my mind, it's a classic Shuttleworth aeroplane. It really is. It's the only, you, you, don't, you don't see these anywhere other than places like this. Uh, it's, got, it's got lots of character. It's a bit quirky, it's a bit unusual. It's a really important piece of uh, aviation heritage that's preserved at the Shuttleworth Collection. Um, and I hope you enjoy watching her fly a little bit later on. Sure. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. So you talked about size. No history. No history. Um, the rudder being taller than the fin almost gives the impression that designers had to extend it after they first built it. Yeah, the question was the, the rudders the rudders much taller than the fin so did, did they the designers have to extend it quite quite possibly the um, if you hold the pedals fixed in the aircraft she she's quite directionally stable as soon as you take your feet off um, she's she's very she's sort of neutrally stable at the best and it, it so that, that means practically you have to use the rudder all the time to keep the aircraft pointing straight. And you've got a slip ball in the cockpit to help you do that. To, you, you should notice because you feel the side forces if you've got big side slip on. A lot of these aircraft um, had, tend to have big rudders to give you directional control for crosswind landings and, and handling and quite small fins. Like, so it's, it's, if you look at the Tiger Moth, it's got a big over center. A lot of the de Havilland designs have big over center rudders and they're very small fin. Um, it, yeah, it's quite, it's quite, well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite possible that they did uh, extend it. 
that an NFS trained PPL with say 70 hours on moths and bluebirds, that sort of thing, could fly this aircraft for hire. What, today? No, back in the oh, back 30s. In, back in the 30s. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. It's not, it's not an, uh, an unreasonable task to ask a, a relatively low time pilot to fly an aircraft like this. It's, it, it sort of looks after you. Yeah. Um, it's got quite nice handling. The tricky bit's always landing, generally. Yeah. Um, and it, the handling qualities in but they have big grass approach airfields configuration. Yeah, 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 I think it's, it's really quite a nice aeroplane for, yeah. for, a, for a low time pilot, and, I think. Uh, just another quick one. As an of air course. taxi, because NFS built a lot of these, in fact they became the agents and they wanted to use them as air taxis. Could this carry three adults with a couple of bags? Uh, two, I think two. The uh, maximum wall up weight's 1,900 pounds. Right. And it's about 1,700-ish with what, a single pilot. So two, two people and a bit of baggage, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Well, or three including the pilot, yeah, yeah so if you... It has very long oleos, and as you say, it comes onto the wheels with no weight on. Does that mean it's easier to do a smooth landing? As it, it, it does. Yeah, if you do a wheeler uh, and just put the main wheels on and then hold the tail off, it's yeah. it, it's very it's very flattering. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And you can see it would. It's got it's got a huge stroke, so yeah, it would soak up bumps quite yeah, nicely. Right. We've got very very good smooth grass surface here, but yeah, I think. It's a good design for rough fields, definitely. But it's better three wheelers or to wheel it on? You always end up with a bit of a wheeler, even with a, it's if you're in the right attitude for, in this attitude, the main wheels will still touch down first. It's, it's difficult to three point yeah. really well, but not impossible, yeah. Is there a chance to taxi on the ground with a moving... Yeah, it's not too... Without, you, you can, you can a bit. We okay. we tend not to here because yeah. we're there's not a huge amount of space. A lot of valuable aeroplanes around. We try to keep away from the runway as possible, especially while the display's on. So we'll we'll generally taxi around with a yeah. with a wing walker. Yeah. But it, but on a big grass airfield, yeah, you can move it around reasonably well. Reasonably well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for thank attending. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.